Let's talk about these developments with our opening panel. I-24 News diplomatic correspondent Mike Wagenheim here in studio and Jonathan Tobin, editor-in-chief at the Jewish News Service. Mike, let's start with you. We have been prognosticating about how this could possibly turn out. Now that Guns has the mandate, what do you think his strategy is? I think it's twofold. Number one, he's trying to divide and conquer this right-wing religious bloc that Benjamin Netanyahu has put together with the Likud party, the two ultra-Orthodox parties, and also the two national religious parties. So his plan is to try to peel some of these parties away from Benjamin Netanyahu. They've all pledged loyalty to him, but loyalty in Israeli politics is worth little to nothing. The other strategy for him, and it's twofold, is to try to develop either a bargaining chip or an actual uh, minority government in the center-left. So try Try to cobble together what's left of the left wing in Israeli politics, try to put it all together, try to get as many seats, squeeze as many seats out of that as possible, and figure out a way either to use it as a bargaining chip to try to pull Likud in, or otherwise to form some sort of unprecedented minority government coming out of elections. And they're not separate plans. They have to be implemented at the same time for one to work against the other. All right, Jonathan Tobin, what do you expect to come out of uh, Gantz holding the mandate? What do you think his likely strategy is? Well, I, I don't disagree about what his strategies are. Uh, the question is whether they have any chance of success. Um, the odds are that they don't. Um, the situation is seemingly reversed with Gantz holding the mandate and Netanyahu not holding it, as, a, as he did in, for the few weeks previous to this. But the math is still the same. Um, the interests of the small parties that are allied to Netanyahu um, in not joining a, a center-left government are still the same. It's not clear that it's in any of their interests to uh, basically to ditch Netanyahu, as much as their loyalty should be questioned. The loyalty of everybody uh, in, in this uh, arrangement should be questioned. After Gantz's mandate runs out, if he can't form a government or a minority government or some sort of a coalition within uh, four weeks, then uh, all bets might be off. It might be a free-for-all. On the other hand, Let's remember that uh, Netanyahu still has more uh, more Knesset, uh, Knesset seats in his pocket right now, mm -hmm. and he may be hoping for a wild card, uh, namely uh, perhaps um, a change in the indictments uh, looming over him, whether one of them is, is rumored some leaks that the most serious one might be dropped. Maybe he thinks that if he waits longer, holds out, um, the math might the math and the odds might turn again in his favor. Mike, as uh, Jonathan Tobin says, a lot riding, of course, on what these indictment hearings could play, uh, could mean for Netanyahu. And Gantz has said that he's not going to sit with a prime minister or anyone facing corruption charges. So technically, he would still be able to keep his campaign promise if these charges are dropped or at least the more serious ones lessened. So it seems as though the attorney general, Mandibolt, is now the kingmaker in all of this. Quite possibly so. Keep in mind, Benny Gantz's mandate will expire on November 20th. There have been varying reports as to when uh, Attorney General Avichai Mandelblit will announce his decision, but the earliest we've heard leaking out is November 15th or somewhere <laughs> in there, so it doesn't leave a whole lot of time for the aftermath to take effect. In fact, if Benjamin Netanyahu is indicted on the more serious charge, does Likud somehow oust him from power and put together a coalition within a matter of days if, in fact, he's not charged with that most serious Series of charge. Benny Gantz has very little time to react and try again to put together that coalition. That's why it's so important for Gantz not to be reactive, but to be proactive and try to lay out all the options now before he winds up having to react to and something that's else. that's assuming that Mandible does make a decision before November 20th while Gantz still holds the mandate, because if it comes afterwards, then that takes away a lot of the options. So, Jonathan, what do you think happens if November 20th comes and goes and Gantz hasn't been able to form a coalition. Well, uh, that's the most likely outcome right now. At that point, um, any member of the Knesset could uh, somehow try to form a coalition, whether that means uh, a rebel Likud faction uh, somehow tries to oust Netanyahu. Again, the odds are against that. Or maybe there are so many people in this equation whose interests are best served by waiting and holding out Maybe it does go to the unthinkable, which is a third election. That shouldn't be ruled out as much as Israelis don't want it, as much as it makes no sense to hold the third vote. Um, Netanyahu but do may you be think, do you think President thinking that that's Rivlin his backup plan. will try to give someone else, a smaller player perhaps, perhaps even leave him in a chance at forming a coalition before it's res the last resort, which is a third election? 
Well, that's, uh, that's another option. How Lieberman does that, um, <laughs> working with the same numbers as Netanyahu and Gantz have done, we don't know. There's so many variables here, so many people with conflicting interests. I've said it before, this is a jigsaw puzzle whose pieces do not fit. And it may be just up to the voters again to try and give us some new pieces to work with. All right. Thank you so much, Jonathan Tobin, Mike Wagenheim. Appreciate your analysis, as you say. A lot of moving parts to try and figure out what the next step could be.